Hi, my name is Greg and we're here at the Georgetown steam plant on the turbine floor next to unit number three, which is my favorite part of the plant. When you go to make electricity here, you need three big pieces to do the job. First, you need a boiler to make uh, the steam. Second, you need a turbine in order to turn that steam into rotational energy. And third, you need a generator to turn that rotational energy into electricity. And we got two of those three pieces right here. So it's simple in concept, but it's more sophisticated, complex, intriguing in its uh, details. And exploring those is what makes it fun for me to be in this place. So I hope I can share some of that with you. Let's go around to the turbine end of things and start there. Turbines are an old idea. It's just like a windmill or a pinwheel where a, a flow of gas makes a shaft turn. And uh, that sounds like a simple concept, but engineers had a real struggle to figure out how to make that work efficiently. At the time that this was being installed, they'd been working on this for 20 or 25 years, trying to figure out how to make the blades of the turbine work efficiently. It was working more efficiently than a reciprocating steam engine, but there was a lot of room for improvement and a lot of sophistication in what goes on in there. This uh, particular machine was designed by Charles Curtis, this type of turbine. His was the first large commercially viable turbine, and it sold like hotcakes at first. First the vertical ones, and then they move to this horizontal style. Now, this particular turbine is about 14,000 horsepower. So, uh, what does that mean? At the time it was put in, this might well have been the most powerful machine in Seattle. It's about the same power as a dozen railroad steam locomotives of the day. Today, that would be about enough to power 10,000 homes. Although in those days, homes didn't have much electricity, so it would have powered even more. Uh, well, so what does it take to make a 10,000 or a 14,000 horsepower machine work? Well, you need a lot of steam. Okay, you make steam at home. You put a, a pot on the stove to make some pasta. You put it on there and you throw on the burner on high and it takes five or 10 minutes to get the pot boiling. And if you just left it boiling like that, it would maybe take half an hour to boil off all that water into steam. Well, imagine if you can a 55 gallon drum. We've all seen these, they're common. And it was full of water. And now you took that drum full of water and you boiled it into steam, pressurized it to 175 PSI, and raised it up to 500 degrees Fahrenheit, and then shot it in through that pipe into the turbine. And you did that every 15 seconds. So you needed about four of those drums full every minute to keep this turbine running. So that took quite a few of the boilers in the other part of the plant to feed the steam just to keep this machine running. All the steam from the boilers is headed together and it comes over here in that large white pipe that you see coming through the wall, down to the stop valve, which is the ball-shaped valve, and then across and into the steam chest up above with the eight control valves where the, you see the springs on top. This uh, controls the uh, amount of steam that's let into the turbine to control its speed or its load. From there, the steam moves down into the turbine itself, which is underneath this insulating casing, and it expands through nine rows of blading, expanding as it goes and driving the turbine to spin. And when it's finished, it exhausts out into the hood at the back end and down through the floor into a condenser, which is down underneath the floor. Uh, what's this condenser thing? Well, engineers realized very early on that they could make the turbine or a steam engine more efficient if the exhaust steam, if they sprayed a little water into it, the exhaust steam would collapse and create a vacuum. And that vacuum would help to pull the steam through the turbine or the engine, and that makes it more efficient. So all three of our large turbines here have, are connected to uh, condensers after the turbine. 
Now we have to control this whole thing. And so the shaft that comes out at the end of the turbine here, there's a, a worm gear and then revolving inside that cylinder is a fly ball type governor that controls, that senses the speed of the machine and through that arm linkage there and this linkage here uh, controls the opening or closing of the control valves in order to keep a constant speed or a constant load on the turbine. Now, that's how the turbine does its job and it's connected in turn directly shaft coupled to the electric generator. The generator is an alternating current. You may have heard of the war of the currents between Edison and Westinghouse, direct current versus alternating current. That had played out about a dozen years before this plant was built and alternating current was the, uh, the better technology and that's what we generate here. And how do you make that? Well, it's a simple in concept. You have a large magnet rotating in the center of a coil of wire and the magnet turning inside the coil of wire is what makes the electricity that comes out from the generator. This particular one is a 10,000 kilowatt generator. It generates the power at 13,800 volts, which then was sent outside the building and stepped up to, the, in the, to go and be distributed on the grid throughout Seattle. For me, the interesting thing to do here is to explore how the, all of this machinery worked and fit together. But even more than that here, because this plant was built over two decades and because the technology of creating electricity was rapidly changing at that time, there's several generations of technology all in this same building. And that makes it really fascinating to look at how the engineers' ideas of the best way to make electricity have been, were changing over the years. So, in this one building downstairs, we have reciprocating steam engines. This is 19th century technology. And also down there, we have small single rotor drive turbines that were the early first attempts to use a turbine instead of a reciprocating piston engine. And then we move up to the first two vertical steam, big steam turbine generators that were the first commercially successful large turbine generators. And then as those were developed for about 10 years, they realized laying this out with a vertical shaft really wasn't the best trade-off and that they had problems that they couldn't grow the machine any bigger than it already was and it was difficult to do maintenance on the machine. So even about the time that Unit 2 was installed here, they began switching to the horizontal layout for the turbine generator shaft like we have here on Unit 3. And this became the standard from here on out and it's still the way they're built today. This was not the end of power plant uh, evolution here when this unit was installed in 1919 things kept changing. Engineers quickly figured out that making the units bigger allowed them to be even more efficient. And the demand for electricity was exploding. So the units needed to be larger and larger, much larger than this one. And there wasn't space to do that here at the Georgetown site. And in addition, a couple of bad changes happened. The river which they needed for cooling was taken away, rechanneled over uh, almost a mile away, and so now it was inefficient to pump cooling water over here from the Duwamish. And the airport was built, and they had to take down the smokestacks. The smokestacks helped uh, make the boilers burn efficiently by moving air through the draft of the boiler, and now they had to employ inefficient fans to do that instead. So even in the 1920s, this wasn't a very viable place to expand anymore. And the Georgetown steam plant was here. It was kept on in a standby capacity. It only operated maybe about 100 hours a year. And maybe every fourth or fifth winter when water flows were low and hydropower wasn't available in quantity, it would run more in the winter. 
the last winter like that, the last time that this plant ran a significant amount, was in 1952-53. And then it just was kept on standby status all the way until the mid 70s. And finally in 1977, it was decommissioned. The plan was to tear it down, but some visionaries saw that there was a unique collection of technology and machinery here that we can all learn from. And they were able to get this nominated as a national engineering landmark, which is the reason that it's still here for us to see today.